dear friends and family, as you are all also extended family, thank you for being here. First and foremost, I would like to welcome you to what on the outside and physically is a beautiful edifice, a white house, a sanctuary, an edifice of learning. Truly a Torah center, an epicenter of spirituality and devotion based on Avodah, which in Hebrew is both worship and work towards a tikkun olam that begins with ourselves. I'd like to mention also those of you who would like to see the main sanctuary downstairs, I'd like you to see it if you have an opportunity. It's very, very beautiful where we pray on Shabbat. Now, all that is due here is due to the spiritual, spiritual and scholarly midot, centered leadership of Rabbi Moshe Nyu and his wife Nahama, the pillars of this congregation, in collaboration with a wonderful team of dedicated individuals to this holy avodah of dedicated individuals to that which emanates from the makom, from the place, divinely imbued center, for the purpose of tikkun olam. This includes Rav Ichi Tridal, Rav Levi, Rav Velvel, Rav Yehuda, with the most able, talented assistants of Hani and Ruchi in the office, who prepare the weekly publications and the inner workings for all that moves forward, Kadima. Such are the individuals who lead the essence of Mashal, an example for which we are all taken with great pride. This is a house of Abu Dhab worship, a center of daily learning, a center and merkaz for the inculcation of devotion to a life of mitzvot and mitzvot. This evening is the Shloshim of my mother, Dr. Therese Lena Shor, Tenya Bat Yaakov Yeroshua, Tenya Bat Leia. This is also the yurt site of the Altar Rebbe, Rav Shnur Zalman of Liadi. The events of these individuals are not endings, but they are very beginnings as to what can be derived and for those who leave a leaving legacy. Perhaps Rabbi Nyu will speak a little bit about, about uh, the Alter Rebbe a little bit later on when we are able to eat together. I will speak to you of my mother. This evening I hope with words as inadequate as they are to express in a short time the glimpse of a life of my mother. For those of you here who had known her to fill you in for yourselves and for others as time passes by as to who she was and to what she did and thus what continues from her. Each one of us saw her differently, all valid as she had many facets. That is to her multi-dimensional essence. I will attempt to sculpt, etch and paint with words what it was like to live with my mother up to the age of 22 first of all. Why? Because we came to Canada when I was three years old. And we lived in the same home till I was 22 and when I married Barbara, as we know, we leave from one woman to another woman. And then we have a, a binding, which I very much do, and I am very grateful for my dear wife, who gave me that home, a baita, in every way possible, from one home to another, uh, in the most loving, wonderful way, in raising our children, and ensuring that the inculcation of that which is deepened, as Rabbi Nyu so beautifully said, that the fermentation, the maturation, the profundity, the essence of all that needs, needs to age uh, is there when the father is so often out of town, not there, not able to be present, when the mother is continually present with her patience, her love, her sensitivity, and her bearing, recognizing that the upbringing is the most important within the home, and the bite is the home, not the bricks and mortar. The 22 formative years in which I grew up gave me very poignant memories of my mother. The memories after marriage are very different because one has one's own home, and one is then given up to a new home that one has built, and that is extremely important. I will also read from one of my mother's songs that she had composed songs and poems and novels and short stories, 17 books in all, taught 6,000 students, had an alumni association of students just for herself, received an honorary doctorate, and she was also uh, a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and as a scholar, which is quite remarkable, in an Ivy League school, having come to Canada uh, from very different beginnings to having done what she did to inspire as many people as she did, and having her own institute created for her by Gratz College, which is the oldest Jewish college in North America, in Philadelphia. It was the Institute for the Growth of Human Potential. 
and she certainly was able to look at someone and knew what they were and what they could become. And that is the whole essence of tikkun olam. I will first paint the background scene of the salon in our home, which I thought everybody had a salon of two rooms, and that many discussions take place in that salon, and that prayer books are usually placed on an antique table with Tehillim and so on, where a mother prays twice a day. Uh, and with mezuzot, for each member of the family, that she kisses each one while she blesses them. And that was the essence of our Tikkun Olam. Let me read you. Um, bear with me. Um, what I wrote when I was 30 years old in a book uh, that was um, published uh, through America and went to Israel, Jerusalem Breezes, my very first book, uh, when I was 30 years old. And I will read you what my impressions were when I was 22 years old. If you don't mind, I'm just going to take this off. I'm not a very tall fellow, but I think I'll see better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The room streamed with light, which burst with dazzling radiance in the mirror, beaming from all the wall lamps on either side of a large fireplace, which was never used. Stephen Lipper is probably, and, and Irene are probably the only ones who will remember this room well, other than Barbara. Beaming from the wall lamps on either side of a large fireplace, which was never used, but was preceded by a regal break front of material similar to the furniture, standing on four curved gold legs. On the mantel of the fireplace stood an antique gold clock with a white face. The timepiece was centered between two rather plump, reclining angels. Ever since I could remember, I had heard it chime only a few times, and made me think always of the two angels that must have been in the Holy of Holies, looking at each other, trying to create an order of peace. Alavai. To the right of the mantel, another large obisong armchair, and in the corner nook of the front portion of the double room salon, a bright wood inlaid finely polished vitrine with curved bay windows displayed tiny porcelain, silver, gold, and semi-precious stone wares on a brown silk lined shelf. On the left of the mirror, which could be seen upon entering the room, from either the regal window double doors of the front or the living room, and the single wooden door at the end of the room was previously one where the reproduction of the Mona Lisa it was a portrait now of my gentle but strong, handsome, expressive, sad, blue-eyed father who had passed away two years ago at a very young age when my mother was 45. Below the portrait, a regular, rectangular, light, gray, marble table edge to the wall with a few mezizas, some in tiny white mother-of-pearl gold-encased jewelry box with a magain david and a few small prayer books with metal covers, the type which one brings back as gifts from Israel. It is here that my mother would pray night after night before she ate breakfast in the morning and before retiring at night. The mezuzahs were lipstick red stained from being kissed and thus each member was blessed and prayed for along with the world around a central prayer, prayer for peace in Israel. It was beside this table that my mother sat on the stool playing the piano immediately to the left of a round blue cushion hassock where I often sat and listened to her sing. The small hands at the gold-painted piano were smooth, only slightly lined, with red fingernails cut short. A loose gold braided stranded bracelet and occasional ring were put aside on the music sheet to avoid clanking the keys. The short but not tiny figure of the brown-haired, round-faced woman with the small, finely sculpted nose seemed to be one with the piano. Playing it was her way of relaxing, of entering another world, a world of yesterday bringing it into her present and subconsciously perhaps trying to figure out what the next step should be in the future of her two sons who she had been left with. She was left with them on the passing of my father, her husband, when the present void in the house suddenly set in on the night of the 29th of September, 1967, the 24th of Elul. Within a matter of hours, on the 30th of September, the 25th of Elul, my grandmother, my mother's kindly, also round-faced, smiling, tiny mother, passed away. It was my grandmother who brought from her large estate home of 12 children with governesses, Hebrew language tutor, and piano specialists from within a tiny village of Poland before the Holocaust. Classical music and the accompaniment of the piano to my grandfather's deep, melodious voice. 
that autumn night had someone linked, somehow linked itself tragically with the Second World War in Poland, and perhaps even more so with the fact that during the war, my mother had been able to save her immediate family, father, mother, and younger brother, and here, without a war, that had not been possible. I remember the stillness of the house during the year of mourning, when the piano was never touched. Yet my mother was determined to give us a pleasant and happy life as possible, while providing all she could materially do by frequently taking the arduous business trips which my father had gone on so often, she was determined to maintain her healthy, positive outlook on life. I realize only now that from the moment on, resolve was in my mother, the same resolve which carried her and her family throughout the entire war. Looking back and now I see the easy smile, the bursts of laughter, the more youthful attitude to life than mine ever is, to which I have grown accustomed, the optimism, the innocence bordering on naivete, the, French, the fresh spring-like creativity of character and the selflessness. The calamity left much sadness, but not a trace of bitterness. Her creative spontaneity had flowered in pub into published books of poetry, novels, short stories, over a hundred songs, music and lyrics in Polish, French, English, an MA in comparative education, a PhD in philosophy, and a meaningful philosophy of purpose, which she teaches in a course entitled Ten Steps in the Land of Life. All of this while being attached to an Ivy League university. The radiant expression of awe, the illumination of her face, the sudden short silence which you know to be a prayer or a psalm of thankfulness for something that God had given her and given her continually has remained. The youthful enthusiasm has not become the least bit tainted by her graduate education. She never dissected that with which there would be no poetry in life. As sunset remained the same marvel for her that it was when her father, my grandfather, a writer, lawyer, poet of life, first pointed out to her when she was a little girl traveling on a train to a vacation spot on the Baltic Sea. To this day, she points out sunsets, flowers, oceans, and trees to us. With, I'm sure, the same childlike expression she showed her father on that train ride prior to the war years ago. The child has remained in her, and it is this that she brings out in us and others. Whatever is unblemished, fresh, spontaneous, disarming, continually surprising, touching the noble emotions, allowing the sentiments to be released, appealing to the finest of instincts, her being evokes. I recall a lecture which we both attended as fellow students in a PhD program in Drops University. The lecture was given by Dr. Israel Efros, a philosopher, poet, professor from Israel, a scholar well over 80, a giant of a kind, gracious man. He spoke of Sadia Gaon's commentary on Bereshit, the creation. While everyone was taking notes, my mother had tears in her eyes, thanking God for being able to participate in such a lecture. Appreciating the miracle of creation, education kindles her poetic nature as it quenches that of others. In her travels to distant cities with my daughter, her grandchild, she steps into historical regal images of the furniture of the Salon. She enters palaces, gardens, sprinkled with fountains, recounting tales of those who had once lived in these surroundings, sharing with my daughter the classical background music of that era, and even occasionally springing up for a quick dance. She holds my daughter in her arms, which I so often recall, on, and on the piano she's playing that song which accompanies me on my continuous journey to Jerusalem. Whether it's the Shar Shemaim before, whether it's the Adaf Israel, or whether it's here in the Montreal Torah Center, I constantly walk that road to Jerusalem on a daily basis. Just as Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav said, that he walked that distance every single day. It's a very short distance. It's a distance that exists within us. And my mother's song, I won't sing it to you, I might intone it in some way, is the following. I walked, I walked through life on my road to Jerusalem. This is my mother's road to Jerusalem, on which she, as a guide, accompanied the whole family to bring us to Jerusalem on a daily basis. I walked, I walked through life on my road to Jerusalem. I walked, I walked through life on my road to Jerusalem, through Paris, Moscow, and Rome, through New York and thousands of towns, through the mountains, forests, and streets, right and left, up and down. From far away I came, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I came here to pray, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They walked, they walked through life, on their road to Jerusalem. They walked, they walked through life on their road to Jerusalem. Through Auschwitz, Gross Rosen and Camps, Warsaw, Ghettos, Treblinka and War, when they whispered Shema Israel, 
on their road to Jerusalem. They will never be forgotten, those who whispered your name, who were dreaming about you, but who never came. They live in the morning dew, in the clouds so gray or blue, and at dawn they touch my hands with millions of hands. From far away I came, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I came here to pray, Jerusalem, blessed, blessed be your name. I prayed in Jerusalem of the wall, I prayed in Jerusalem of the wall. I prayed for the peace of the world, I prayed for the peace of the world. I repeated my old Hebrew prayer, which my mother taught me one day, and I wondered if the crowd, choir of angels prayed with me for every man on earth. I prayed in Jerusalem at the wall, I prayed in Jerusalem at the wall. I prayed for the peace of the world, I prayed for the peace of the world. I was praying for Jews and for Muslims, for all Christians, all Buddhists, all men. I was praying for those who were forbidden to pray, and my voice went up to heaven at the wall of Jerusalem. My old prayer so eternal for all my fellow men. At the sunset the sun was smiling, waving to me through the clouds. For a while I closed my eyes, waiting for the stars. I was dreaming about people joining hands across the seas, building bridges through the mountains over hate and enemies. And the flowers whispered softly, peace had come into the world. God was happy, God was singing in Jerusalem at the world. I prayed in Jerusalem at the wall. I prayed in Jerusalem at the world wall. I prayed for the peace in the world. I prayed for peace in the world. And one day when my dream will come true, men will never kill other men. All the children will live without fear and enjoy the daily bread of peace. All the rivers in the west and the east, all the mountains in the south and the north, they will listen to God who will, will sing in Jerusalem at the wall. I share with you, my mother believed in this so much that when she began her correspondence with Pope John Paul II, who had given false papers to many people during the war and did not convert them, and had a fund for the end of the war to send them to Israel, she said to him, not only must you change all the prayers and must you change all the various uh, excerpts that mention Jews and in an anti-Semitic way that must be taken out and must be changed. What you must do is one day go to Jerusalem and apologize to what, what the Christian church has done, not only during the Second World War, but for centuries. And he says, I'll do it for you. My mother was at his side at the Kotel. An exception was made that a woman was standing beside the Pope when he apologized for what the Christian church had done in massacring Jewish children throughout the ages. He also went to Yad Vashem and he said, we are responsible for so much of this. I'll share with you also another thought where my, the, the Kotel comes into my mind. When I was a volunteer at the age of 19, I was a volunteer, I left on the first plane from here in 1967 to be a Midnadev, right on the border with Syria. And when Rabbi Gorin sounded the shofar at the Kotel, I thought this was a new beginning, a new beginning that would change everything. And it has to one day change everything. And that's where I was with this song, exactly as it was. I prayed at Jerusalem at the wall. I'll read you one more short poem that describes my mother's dream on Kol Nidre night after she went out of the Shar Shemayim where she felt that the sanctity of the day had brought her the dream. My mother never believed that I said before that things have to be as they are but things have to become as they should become one day with a tikkun olam. The dream of Kol Nidre night in memory of my dear mother, Lucia Herzig. This is written in memory of her mother. The wind chanted an ancient melody. The falling leaves played an, angeless, an ageless symphony that echoed throughout the world, wherever Jews prayed on Konidre night. And somewhere colorful flowers bowed their heads like people in silent contemplation of God. The forests, the gardens, the winds, the seas, and the memories of yesterday were met in tribute to the divine spark in man who begs forgiveness on Kol Nidre night. It is written, man cannot live by bread alone. On Yom Kippur, thoughts take the place of bread. You live by searching your heart for prayer. I was alone listening to the wind and watching the sky near the synagogue on Kensington Avenue. All the worshipers had gone home. They had finished their Kol Nidre prayers 
and the street was empty. I was alone beseeching God to teach me how to live and understand the truth of survival through suffering and struggle to lead me through the winding trails of wisdom to the shore of peace. Frightened, I remember the war of yesterday and the ashes scattered in the fields of unsought glory. Frightened, I sense the danger of today, of violence unleashed in the mysterious age of the atom. Frightened, I search for the light of tomorrow's destiny. I raised my eyes to the dark sky and, for, and far, far away between two shining stars, I saw a cup of wine. To who, I wondered, did the cup belong? I had no one to ask. To whom did it belong? Then suddenly the, an angel appeared on Kensington Avenue. The angel put his hand on my shoulder and showed me the way. Follow me, he said. The door of the synagogue opened. As I entered, whispering, Shema Yisrael, trembling without fear, I followed the angel down the aisle, straight to the bima. Behind the curtains of heavy silk shone the holy ark. My heart beat faster. As a woman, I was never called to the Torah. Now the sense of nearness to God's gift and to man's treasure gave me strength. The angel's radiant face was mirrored in my eyes, as if to guide me in my prayer. O oh God, I began. I did not go home tonight. I remained to glorify your name with the wind and the stars. O oh God, permit me to pray for all those who departed, leaving no sons or daughters. O oh God, permit me to recall the nameless martyrs. I am a mother, therefore God, permit me to cry for all the mothers of the six million Jews killed in the war that was fought in my lifetime. O oh God, permit me to remind the living of all the martyrs who died with the words Ani Ma'amin on their lips. Ani Ma'amin, I believe. Silence reigned in the synagogue. Only one light flickered. I covered my face with my hands, but the light of the one, blessed be he, blessed be his name, for whom I had long came to me. The curtain of heavy silk was pushed aside by an unseen hand. The angel held the Torah now and stood beside me. I marveled at the giant angel in whose arms the Torah shone, the Torah source of strength for countless generations in every corner of the world. For this Torah, the joy of human understanding, dignity and wisdom, we had to fight and so many times to die. Suddenly I beheld all those whom I remembered from the pages of history. Each seat was now taken. They had all come. A Jewish mother from Spain, Dolores of Saragossa, from the Inquisition. A witness of this inquisition, wearing her dark mantilla, began her story. Long, long ago in our home, the name of God was cherished more than life. We had friends amongst the nobles. We had dignity and wealth. We perished in the name of God. al Kiddush Hashem. Ani Ma'amin, I chanted. A Jewish mother from Russia, Malka of Odessa, wearing a kerchief on her head, stood up and spoke. On the day of the pogrom, our street was white. It had been snowing. And through a window I heard a cry, Ani Ma'amin, I chanted. A Jewish mother from Poland, Basha of Krakow, young, 20 years old, raised her head and cried, pray, pray for the children of Krakow, for the little Jewish girls, for the little Jewish boys, led to the slaughter by the crime of the world, by the silence of cowardly men. Ani Ma'amin, I chanted. A Jewish mother from France, Jeanette of Versailles, a tiny, frail woman, spoke haltingly of her son, a poet killed in a prison in Paris. Do not forget his letters, she said. We never die. We will only go away to sing the greatness of God. Al Kiddush Hashem. We never die. We will go away and the name of God will be blessed again. We never die. We only go away from the world which by God's will shall be rebuilt. More beautiful, to, than, more beautiful tomorrow. Ani Ma'amin, I chanted. The angel looked at me. I saw he was smiling and now he said, listen, my friend, we'll speak. A radiant woman moved up the aisle. In her hand, she held the cup of wine, the cup that I'd seen between the two shining stars. The cup of wine, she said, is waiting for tomorrow. The wine of brotherhood to be lavished upon the nations of the world. She stopped a moment and continued, I saw you on Kensington Avenue in Canada, the land of freedom. I saw you, the living, who did not forget the dead. You are not alone. The dead will never be forgotten as long as you continue to glorify God's name. I am Sarah, mother of Israel. I was killed in Jerusalem not long ago. I was killed millions of times and I always come back. I will never die. Jewish mothers always return to life, stronger with more hope. I wander through the clouds and I sing like you, Ani Ma'amin. I felt the angel's hand upon my forehead. A ray of sunshine came through the window. I shall never forget my dream of Kol Nidre night. So apropos what Rabbi Nu said before about the wine, 
that wine of redemption, the wine that one day will bring about the announcement that there will be a new tomorrow, Mashiach will come, and it's not the world as it is, it's the world as we will make it, because each one of our essences that has each one of us a road to Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you.